Shalom. First off, I'm going to give all praises, honor, and glory to Yahweh. By Hashem Yahushah, by Hashem Rakak with us. I want to give double honors to the apostles and the elders of Great Millstone. And this is Shir Shalom to all the Ankim out here that's doing the pushing the work in truth and in sincerity. Okay? Um, doing a video on this article from the newspaper company in Baltimore called the Baltimore Sun. Um, and it says, Baltimore hasn't done enough to acknowledge its, its role in the slave trade. Okay? Um, I'm going to read some of the article and I'm going to get some scriptures. Okay, it says, in his June 22nd Sun column, Exhibit looks at city's role in slave trade. Jack, Jack Kez, uh Kelly references former Enoch Pratt Free Library staffer Ralph Clayton's 2002 book, uh, Cash for Blood. Mr. Clayton's writing depicts Baltimore Inner Harbor area is sacred ground where countless thousands of men, women, and children suffered during Baltimore's darkest hour. Baltimore was one of the leading ports for auctioning slaves and shipping them from the Inner Harbor and Fells Point to the Deep South, a process that separated families forever and a destination from which they never returned. Um, was that part of the, um, the curses? Okay. In uh, Deuteronomy 28, which it says that um, families being separated, okay, and um, one of the scriptures that come to mind is when it says that uh, Deuteronomy 28 and 32, your sons and your daughters shall be given unto another people and your eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long, and there shall be no might in your hand. Okay? Was that's going towards the people that was brought in on slaves, the slave ships, okay, that was separated from their family. Okay, their daughter, sons and daughters was given on to another people. It says major dealers from Kentucky, Georgia, Virginia and Tennessee built slave pens in the harbor area for holding their purchases until ready for shipping. One cruelly ironic twist pointed out by Clayton is that Joseph Donovan built such a slave pen in the 1850s on the southwest corner of Camden and Utah streets where the statue to the white hero Babe Ruth now stands at Oreo Park at Camden Yards. Okay? And when those people um, bought the slaves, okay, they gave them last names. Okay? Slave owner last names. Okay? And that also fits uh, scriptures also. Um, Jeremiah 4, and the 17 and 4. And you, even yourself, shall discontinue from your heritage that I gave you, okay? Because we don't have our um, original last names, okay? Which is after our fathers. It's supposed to be after your father, but it's after your slave owner or even after your mother, okay? In this society, it says, And I will cause you to serve your enemies in the land which thou knowest not, for you have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. We're continuing on with the article. It says, um, Clayton adds broken hearts on Pratt Street. Okay. Now, another scripture comes to mind. Okay. Is Habakkuk 2 and 12. Woe to him that builds a town with blood and establishes a city by iniquity. Okay, in Baltimore, you know that that's kind of how a lot of the money came in uh, to play with this uh, this city also, based off of the, the sales that they made. Okay, but um, I believe that's all on that part of the article. 
if I'm not mistaken, okay. Um, that article was five days ago. It says this is another one. It says JHU or Johns Hopkins University too must atone for its slavery connection. Okay, last year George Georgetown University joined other peer institutions and in taking steps to address its historic ties to the slave trade. Johns Hopkins says that history, which means it shares the obligation to address it. The first endowed chair at Johns Hopkins was established in 1889 by Caroline Donovan, for whom the Caroline Donovan Professorship in English Literature is named. She is described as having a prominent Baltimore philanthropist by the I mean, having been a prominent Baltimore philanthropist by the university's own materials. But that description conceals more than it reveals. Carolyn Donovan was also the wife of Donovan Don Joseph Donovan, one of the largest slave traders in, in the state's history. Few traders anywhere rivaled Donovan's operation. By the Civil War, he had purchased more than 2,000 slaves in the Maryland area, all of whom shipped to New Orleans to be resold. More, most, most were permanently separated from their families. For the Donovans, the slave trade was a lucrative business. The 1860 I mean, census, taken the year before his death, listed Donovan. I mean, Joseph. Yeah, Donovan's total wealth is four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, more than twelve million. Today, when he died, he left Caroline Donovan a very wealthy, I mean, yeah, very wealthy widow. This seems damning, damning in terms of Johns Hopkins' connection to the slave trade. Still, for his sake of river, rigor, is worth looking at specifics. Did the hundred thousand dollars Donovan donated to John Hopkins in 1885 more than two million? Two point million in today's dollars actually come from her husband's slave trading operations. Yes, it did. Okay. Yes, it did. At the time of her donation, and a lot of these companies out here, they got rich off of this this the the, the slave trade. Okay. That's how that's how they got rich, man. Okay. And they're still rich today. Because Johns Hopkins is a major hospital and uh, university in this, uh, in this uh, state, okay? It says, at the time of her donation, Carolyn Donovan reported owning six warehouses located on Charles Street that produced between 4000 and 5000 yearly. If we assume she already owned all six warehouses at the time of her husband's death, and that her own earnings were stable and continuous, Carolyn Donovan may, may have accumulated 120000 by the time she donated to Johns Hopkins, in which case the money was hers, not her husband's. Okay, then it says, However, we must consider that Carolyn Donovan's donation from her warehouse income, assuming it was the source, was only possible because she possessed significant wealth on which to live her day-to-day -day life the source of that wealth was without a doubt her husband's career is a slave trader her money was his money and her mo his money was hers and no mi and make no mis and make no mistake it was all blood money which once again woe to him that builds a town with blood and establishes a city by iniquity okay because it's all blood money Okay, these people got rich off of the blood, the um slave trade. Okay, and it's no secret, man. Okay, even if they did try to um uh bring out information, the damage is already done, man. You know, the damage is already done. Okay, this is Ecclesiastes three and fifteen. That which is has been is now. 
Okay, that's why you see a lot of these um these businesses now they got rich off of the slave trade. Okay? And that and that which is to be has already been. Okay? And Yahweh by Shimia requires that which is past. So the Lord looks at all of that stuff, the way that they established this 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 uh city, okay, he requires all that stuff. It says, and moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment, that wickedness was there. And this that that, that this article, both articles are basically telling you that it's blood money, okay? It's all blood money. Okay? That wickedness was there. And the place of righteousness. That iniquity was there. Okay? I said in my heart. God shall judge the righteous. And the wicked. For there is a time that. there For there is a time. There for every purpose. And for every work. Okay? So the fact that they did those things okay in the slave trade and and still doing what they're supposed to do now okay the lord is going to judge them for that okay and you, you got people that sitting up there saying well that wasn't me that was my people back then okay that was that I, I wasn't around during the time of slavery well the scripture still the lord still requires that okay and you people were if you could receive that, were the people that um, was doing that stuff back then. Okay? Nahum 1 and 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. And it's not going to be no, okay, you're free to go. Okay? All your, your, uh, your charges that was brought against you, they're no longer. No, all them charges are going to be... be, be and they're being read to you right now, okay. And and like it's like the scriptures say, the Lord is going going to um, he's going he's going to basically judge you you uh you people man for doing this wicked stuff man, okay. It says the Lord has His way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of His feet, okay. So pretty much, man, no matter what, what they they do, okay, they can say, you know, uh, yeah, we did this and the slavery and all that stuff. Try to sweep stuff under the rug, but guess what? The Lord sees everything, okay? And he's they're not going to get away free, okay? So with that, I want to say Shalom.